Tonight on the Austrian Economics Forum, free market legend Dr. Walter Block joins us. Dr. Block is the Harold E. Rith Eminent Scholar Chair in Economics in the College of Business at Loyola University, New Orleans. He is also the Adjunct Scholar at the Mises Institute and the Hoover Institute. He holds a PhD in Economics from Columbia University, and he's written over two dozen books, including Defending the Undefendable. Dr. Block joins us tonight to discuss his book, The Privatization of Roads and Highways. Dr. Block, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Good to be with you. So I want to jump right in and, and let's talk a little bit about the history of, of private roads. You know, uh, since the beginning of time, private roads have existed. The original roads were toll roads and they've been around for at least 2,700 years um, since at least the 7th century uh, BC. And the idea of, of taking private capital to build roads has been going on since at least the 17th century, uh, going back to Britain. Um, when the Castrap Parliament began chartering private corporations to fund uh, what are called turnpikes, which those not from the Northeast uh, may not be aware of those turnpikes are almost always toll roads, uh, whether they're uh, purely private or if they're private public partnerships. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of, of private roads and, and how that became a government domain? Yes, uh, and I think your history is uh, exactly correct, and very few people know that. A lot of people think of highways as always been a government operation and you just can't have um, uh, private roads. It's sort of like death in taxes. It's inevitable and, and private roads are inevitable. Uh, sorry, government roads are inevitable and we can never have private roads. But uh, we did have private roads. And um, uh, in the early days, uh, they were just gravel roads, dirt roads, because we didn't have uh, cement and we didn't have um, uh, tar and stuff like that. It was a, a reasonably um, irrational uh, scheme. And um, all was well for many years, many decades. And then finally, the government decided, well, what about people who skip around, the, <laughs> skip around and don't pay the toll? Well, Previously, you, you call the cops. It's, it's sort of like if you come into my um, uh, shoe store and you walk out with shoes without paying for it, I'll call the cops and then shoe stores would be viable. Imagine if I called the cops and I said, well, we're not going to protect shoe stores. Well, you could hardly have shoe stores if they wouldn't come and uh, get shoplifters. They uh, decided, well, uh, if people uh, don't pay the turnpike uh, booth, too bad, uh, we're not going to stop them for theft of services. And then uh, it became unviable. Very, well, yeah, that's, that's, it's interesting you mentioned the, them becoming unviable because the, the next thing I was going to mention is, is that um, these turnpike corporations, uh, they simply didn't make money. Uh, they, you know, they, they weren't a, a new profit center. You would, you would imagine uh, that people would build these roads out of, out of the profit motive and they would be um, really greedy and, and you'd end up having these outrageous rates to, to travel on the roads. But that's really not what happened. What, what appears to have happened is it was, a, it was a community approach and the community needs and the benefits of the community being connected to the larger um, uh, engine of, of commerce is, is kind of what, what drove that. Um, can you talk a little bit about that history and, and how, that, how that fell out of fashion? Yeah, well, you're quite right that uh, you wouldn't charge unconscionable uh, uh, gigantic rates because then no one would come. And what you want to do is you want to encourage people to come on your road. You want to encourage them to build a house, to build a shopping center, to build a store, to build a factory. And if you're going to charge outrageous rates, they're not going to come on your road and your road is not going to do so well. So it's not that, I mean, greed is good. Profit seeking is good. And the more profits, the better. But the way to maximize profits is not to charge a million dollars every time you get on my road, because then you're not coming on my road. You go on a different road, and that other road will then have stores and, and uh, factories and homes and stuff like that. So uh, there'd be a little competition between road owners, which would keep prices down. The same thing with shoes. If I charge a million dollars for a pair of shoes, I'm going broke, even if the cops will protect me. Because there's a certain rationality in, in pricing, and, and roads are no different than shoes or shirts or anything else. Yeah, I, mean, I think cell phones are, are a great example. They require a lot of infrastructure. You have to buy land. They've got to be um, not necessarily in a straight contiguous line like a uh, continuous line like a road, but they've got to overlap, right? Um, you have the uh, eminent domain as, as something that gets thrown out there as well. But you know, these private roads kind of went out of fashion in the late 19th century. Um, and then now there are very few private roads uh, in the United States compared to other parts of the world. 
uh, you know, a couple stand out to me. One is uh, there's an example of St. Louis uh, ceding uh, property back to the homeowners so they could take up private roads in the city of St. Louis. Uh, another is um, in 2006, Mayor Daley leased out the Chicago Skyway for 99 years for $1.8 billion. And uh, that road, which is a tremendous road if you've ever been from Northwest Indiana trying to get into the city of Chicago, um, that road had lost money for decades. And then within only months of being turned over to be private, um, it started to turn It started to turn a profit. Um, I'm shocked that private enterprise did better than government. What? You must be crazy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, of course. So you, you're quite right. Yeah, and so, that, and so that's, that's the big point economists make is, is you know, that the government is, is almost always as uh, inefficient compared to private, the private sector. Um, and, and one of the, the notes I had from your book is, is a, a couple of quotes here. Um, one is, is that the institution of government has planned, built, and managed and maintained our highway network for so long that few people can even imagine any other workable possibility. Um, and, and it's just kind of become become the default. You know, the explanation of apathy toward highway mismanagement. This is another quote from your book. The uh, explanation of apathy toward highway mismanagement that seems most reasonable is that people simply do not see any alternative to, to government ownership. With roads, they forget about the history that there were once private roads. And they think that, you know, it's sort of inevitable that government has to run it. Why did I write this book? One reason I wrote this book was because 40,000 people a year die in, in traffic fatalities. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's not really government's fault. The reason we have uh, the traffic fatalities and deaths on the highways and streets and pedestrians is, uh, oh, uh, vehicle speeding and um, uh, drunken driving and, um, I don't know, a, a, a driver inattention, you're, you're looking at your cell phone or uh, maybe the, uh, the vehicle uh, malfunctions or you got a tire blown out or something like that. And I say, that's got nothing to do with government. But I say in this book, no, 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 no. Th those are just proximate causes. The ultimate cause is the manager doesn't get rid of that stuff. And the analogy I like to use is, uh, suppose we're brought in to uh, uh, find out why a restaurant went broke, broke. And we say, well, the food was lousy and the location was on a cul-de-sac and, uh, and the place was dirty and, and the service was lousy. No, those are just proximate causes. The ultimate cause, the manager didn't manage his way out of a paper bag. He should have located the restaurant in a better place, hire a better waitress, a better chef, whatever. Well, it's the same thing here. It, it, the, the bottom line or the, the, the buck stops with the manager. And as an economist, I know that competition brings about a better product. And if I said on my road, if you go 100 miles an hour, you lose your car. And on your road, if you said you go 100 miles an hour, you uh, go to jail for 10 years or something like that, then we'd see which way was a better way to, to uh, stop um, uh, fatalities. Uh, because competition brings about a better product, and there's no reason why road should be a, a, a counterexample. The, the, the only thing that the competition doesn't work is roads. Uh, another point that I make in the book is maybe we shouldn't have um, a speed limit for the road. Maybe each lane should have a speed, not a speed limit, but a, 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 a speed minimum and maximum. Namely, in the right-hand lane, you have to do 55. In the middle lane, you have to do 70. And in the left lane, you have to do 85. Would that uh, save lives? We don't know because we're not allowed to try it. And, you know, maybe on your road, it would be 50, 60, and 70 or uh, uh, 60, 70, and 80. Who knows? But if we try different things and now my road has fewer deaths than your road, I'm going to say you're a bum. Anthony is a bum. Don't go to Anthony's road. Come to Walter's road and vice versa if, if you had a better thing. And then if you had a better thing and fewer people died on your road, I would emul I emulate you. Just well, like I, I think we see some of that that the dynamic lane uh, speeds in Germany, right? And and you know we talk about uh, death rates, and there's there's another great quote from your book where you say it is illogically uh, fallacious to place blame for the accidents on unsafe conditions while ignoring the manager whose responsibility it is to ameliorate those factors. In other words, uh, you know if this were a business, if this were a um, uh, a theme park, right? And these were rides that you were riding and people were getting hurt, you would have to stop and, and, and repair those because you would you would have liability, which brings me to the, the big uh, first big difference between public and, and private roads, and that's immunity versus insurance. Simply put, the, the federal government uh, or the state government, whatever government has implemented these roads, enjoys sovereign immunity, whereas the private owner has to have insurance, which brings us back to the accountability of the pocketbook. 
um, you know, ultimately that private corporation is going to live or fail uh, by their ability to, to survive in the marketplace. And part of that's going to be going to be safety. And if they if they can't meet a minimum safe road, people just simply aren't going to consume that product. They'll go bankrupt. Somebody else will come in and probably do a better job. And you simply can't, you don't have that possibility with the current government management. Um, they've got immunity and, and that kind of takes away from them um, certain incentives to make it a safer road. Now, you know, one, one could have the, the debate about uh, is the road freer under these private experiments versus, uh, you know, under, under the government experiments. And that's highly conditional. Um, but it's undeniable that uh, the current system, uh, the people who administer it have no direct responsibility based on the safety numbers. Uh, the, the next thing I want to talk about was the, the pricing model, if you don't mind. Um, Which, I didn't hear you. Uh, the pricing model. So in, in public roads, it's a, it's a pooled resource, um, and it's virtually a flat pricing model. We, we, we do pay a tag for, to have the car on the road, and we do pay a fuel fee um, either for electric on the tag or uh, at the gas pump for traditional ICE vehicles, internal combustion vehicles. But essentially, it's treated like a, a, a flat fee. Um, and, you know, traditional economists say, well, if you've, if you've lowered the, the price down to zero, you've pretty much maximized um, the demand. And, and so that, that manifests itself in rush hour traffic in the terms of, of congestion. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, fees and congestion and managing that and, and the current price structure. Okay. Well, there is this thing in economics called peak load pricing, P-E-A-K, not P-E-E-K. You're not peaking at anything. It's... Um, uh, <laughs> valleys and, and uh, mountains. Uh, we have peak load pricing in lots of industries. For example, uh, in Vail, Colorado, they charge you a lot during the winter when they're skiing. But during the summer, who wants to go to a ski resort? Very few people. So they charge you much, much less and they try to encourage you to come in August. And it's nice there. You go on the ski lifts and you can see it's touristy, but it's much less uh, expensive than in, in the winter. So we have peak load pricing and all sorts of things. Restaurants charge more for dinner than lunch, even though it's the same stuff, because pe people want to go out for dinner more or for lunch. They'll just have a sandwich or something like that. So that's what we would do on the roads if we had any rationality. Whereas right now, you know, you go to New York or Chicago or any big city, and the fastest way to get around town is on a bicycle, not on, not on a car, because you just have congestion. Well, what you have to do is charge a, a little bit more during rush hour. So the whole thing uh, would work much better. Whereas right now, you're bumper to bumper. Uh, the Long Island Expressway is sometimes called the longest parking lot in the world because <laughs> it's uh, 110 miles and, and nobody moves. You just sort of sit there and uh, contemplate the, the, the exhaust fumes of the guy in front of you. And then people get angry at each other and they, they have fistfights and, and you have deaths over uh, he, he cut me off or whatever it is. So uh, th this would be the rational way to do it. Uh, they don't do it because, you know, it's government and they, they pay no penalty for not acting rationally. But in every other uh, aspect of the economy, and I gave all these examples about ski lodges and uh, the summer and winter and stuff and uh, lunch and dinner, we have rational economy and, and, and we don't have this inefficiency. Uh, yeah, I mean, to have people sit bumper to bumper. It ruins the GDP. They could be producing stuff. We could be a lot richer. And if we were a lot richer, we'd have more money to stop diseases and, you know, get to the moon better or whatever it is. But if people are just sitting there bumper to bumper, uh, it's it's irrational. Yeah, no, there, there's a huge economic loss from, from any potential productivity or even recreation, right? Because people that are happier are going to produce better um, in their normal job, even if the hours aren't extended. And, and so, you know, that congestion is a sign of shortage, and that shortage is made worse by the fact that there's a flat pricing structure so that you're not having to pay per usage, right? And that leads to this, this other concept, which is induced demand. And so you can read report after report where economists say um, that uh, building new roads uh, induces demand on the roads and, and results in more traffic. And I take huge issue with that because I say that you can only have induced demand when you increase demand, right? So let's say we're talking about cookies. When cookies are a dollar a cookie, I'm going to eat X number of cookies. When the cookies drop to 20 cents a cookie, I'm going to eat Y cookies and it's going to be more cookies, right? Well, roads aren't like cookies. I can only drive on one road at a time and it takes me a good 14 to 16 years 
to train and have a human legally operate on a road, right? And so how is it that there could be induced demand if there's given a 16 year lag time in getting somebody else to come on the road? It's gonna be a very small edge case where somebody who drives a bicycle is gonna go and buy a house out in the suburbs and get a car and move out there because there's a new road out there. What, what they're doing is they're confusing a shift in demand um, from a short perpetual shortage caused by government mis mismanagement um, with new demand. And, and I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way, but I've not seen anybody write on that. And it's kind of infuriating to me because there's just no way that they've ever met the shortage. And therefore, th how could there be new demand? And besides that, you can only drive on one road at a time. They can pave all the roads they want. I can only go on one at a time. So my demand is, is going to be relatively fixed in an absolute sense. I wonder what your thoughts on that might be. Well, you know, I'm not sure I follow fully uh, because you can only eat one cookie at a time. <laughs> and, right, but 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 when the price goes down, I could buy several of those cookies and store that and have pent up demand that's consumed later, right? True, but you can only eat one at a time and, unless you're a pig and you eat two cookies yeah. at a time. But um, uh, it's true you can only drive on one road at a time, but you could drive uh, 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes mm -hmm. a day, 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, five hours a day. And the higher the price, presumably other things equal, uh, the less you'll drive. Uh, yeah. And I would say the induced demand would be typically at, at peak hour because at the other times of the day, the, 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 the induced demand wouldn't materially matter, right? I mean, it's some wear and tear on the road, but it's not actually causing the congestion. Well, there is another way to look at this. And uh, some people say, well, the way to stop congestion, forget about peak load price, and that's uh, economic gibberish. Uh, they say, well, the way to reduce um, uh, congestion is build more roads. Yeah. namely the supply curve out to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't work. Uh, you build more roads and, and, and they, they soon get filled up. I think the, the best way to, to do that is uh, to have a higher price. Look, wh whenever this congestion, it means demand is greater than supply. Mm -hmm. That's right. If the man, uh, let's return the shoes. If the demand for shoes was greater than the supply, the price would tend to rise and this would induce other people to make more shoes and it would encourage people. Uh, Imelda Marcos had 4,000 pair of shoes or something like that. Well, at a higher price, maybe she'd only have 3,000 shoes or, or something like that. So I, I think it's definitive that the way to get rid of the congestion is not to build more roads. It's rather to raise the prices. And when you raise prices, people stand, tend to uh, start to carpool you know, you have the soccer moms, and each soccer mom brings one kid to, to school. And the soccer moms all live within a quarter mile of each other, let's say. Or, uh, and now you get five of them together, and they all put their kids in one car. And, and, and on Monday, uh, the, the Monday morning soccer mom takes five kids to school. And on Tuesday, the Tuesday soccer mom takes kids to school. And then you have only one car instead of five cars on the road. Well, that's the way to reduce congestion. And, and if it doesn't reduce congestion, raise the price a little bit more. And then instead of having cars with uh, only five or six seat belts, you, you'll get the uh, soccer moms buying a car with 12 seat belts. And uh, that'll uh, even reduce uh, congestion more. So uh, what you want to do is get to some sort of equilibrium price where cars in the city go at around 30 miles an hour or something like that maybe 25 miles an hour, uh, and, and uh, people on the highway go at uh, 70 miles an hour or 75, something like that. And you keep moving the prices up and down, maybe uh, on, on Saturday and Sunday, it's cheaper or more expensive, I don't know. And, and certainly at four in the morning, you, you don't even have to charge any price at four in the morning. You could have um, uh, like a lost leader, you know, you go to Walmart, and they don't charge you for parking and they don't charge you for um, electric uh, and they don't charge you for uh, <laughs> uh, sweeping the floors. It's in the price. So uh, there might be uh, at, uh, you know, from uh, one, one in the morning till five in the morning, uh, go travel all you want. And then you get a lot of trucks tra uh, traveling at night Whereas right now those big 18 wheelers hog up all sorts of space. And it would be much better if they went at night. And then maybe you would charge a little bit uh, from one to five in the morning. Well, let's talk a little bit about, about those private roads and what the benefits would look like. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk a little bit about what maybe the implementation. So, um, you know, we talked about there's experimentation and innovation that's going to occur. Um, you know, just kind of like the, the states are supposed to do it now, but the federal government kind of um, 
standardize the roads nationwide, so we don't have that. But we do see some experimentation from the private sector. Uh, Domino's Pizza comes to mind in that there are these potholes that weren't being paved across the country, and they came in with professional equipment, and you know, corporate sponsored the pothole and and, and uh, spray painted it or put a logo on it to to name it. Um, I thought that was relatively an ingenious way of handling it. Um, I've seen a great meme on the internet that says uh, somebody called the city our potholes need to be mowed. Um, and, and, you know, we've also seen uh, some kind of activism where people will spray some uh, some graphics around a particular pothole to get the city to come and, and, and pave it uh, sooner than later. So, so clearly the, the maintenance isn't happening on, on the city side and we're getting some innovation. What would, what would that look like in the private world? Would Domino's be sponsoring the potholes on, on these private roads or, you know, tell me about some innovative things we could do in the free market with roads. I mean, that's pathetic. That poor Domino's, which is selling pizza. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Has to fill in potholes. Notice that Domino's doesn't come into any shoe store and say, well, you know, we need better benches for people to sit down and, and uh, try on a shoe. Uh, they don't have to do that because the shoe guy is taking care of that. Uh, this is pathetic. It's sort of like public parks. What you'll have is public parks are disgraceful. So uh, individual good citizens come in and they try to mow the, the lawn or uh, fix up the, the, the dirty um, uh, bathrooms or something. And you know what happens? Then the workers who are hired by the, uh, by the government, they say, no, no, you can't do that because you're taking away our jobs. I mean, it, 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 I, mean I, I applaud Domino's. I, I, look, I live in New Orleans. And uh, I don't like to brag, but New Orleans probably got more potholes per square mile than than any other place, mainly because we're built on a swamp. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you put in a new road and then five years later it's crumbling because the uh, the swamp underneath is a little unstable. Whereas New York City is built on a rock and you build a road there, it'll stay for the next thousand years. Uh, I'm I'm exaggerating, but uh, so we've got more potholes than anyone else. And what people do is they'll take a a garbage can and they'll stick it right in the pothole to warn each other and to embarrass the government. And yet the government has got all sorts of money for all sorts of other things. But, uh, you know, you have to drive around the, the garbage can, which is in a big hole. And some of those holes are big enough to put in a motorcycle. Uh, it's just a disgrace, and, and I could see why Domino's would do, do something about that. But the fact that they have to do shows that there's something rotten in Denmark, to mix my metaphor here, that there's something uh, crazy, because we don't have that in ordinary. Uh, nobody goes into a hotel, a private hotel, and starts um, uh, sweeping. Uh, that, that is no stranger goes into the hotel. <laughs> the hotel hires somebody to keep the, the floors clean. Domino's doesn't have to go in a hotel. Domino's doesn't have to go into a, a, a private shopping mall and, and uh, fix the potholes there. Because in Walmart, Walmart has a, a big parking lot. Domino's doesn't have to go into Walmart and start fixing the potholes in, in, in the Walmart uh, parking lot. Because Walmart would be humiliated <laughs> if they had these gigantic pot- potholes. People wouldn't come in there. People wouldn't trust them. They'd go to Rouse's or they'd go to Safeway or, or something like that. Th- there's competition. So that brings me to the point of, of competition. You know, so um, from the consumer's perspective, you know, we might take a different road because it's got a better surface. You know, I used to live in Mobile, Alabama, so I'm very familiar with the, the potholes that appear from being in, in kind of that swampy area. Area. Um, and I would go down different roads based on the car that I was in because I didn't want to hit those those potholes. Um, but similarly, here in Alabama, we've got the, the Foley Beach Express, um, which I've happily paid uh, to go that route to avoid beach traffic in the summer. Um, and then we have a, we have four toll roads here in Alabama. The, uh, another one is up by Tuscaloosa, and I've taken it to avoid downtown, going through downtown to get to the interstate. And because, frankly, there's less traffic and the road conditions are better. And so, you know, if you start bringing that in scale to the private market, I think you'll start seeing people have to maintain their roads better um, and maintain the speeds, which, which gives me another example, which is there's a tunnel in Paris where it's a double-decker tunnel. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. Um, but in this double-decker tunnel that they've built, they have like 350 cameras to monitor the entire tunnel so, because they get paid by the car. And so as soon as there's a wreck and traffic stops, they start losing money. So um, they have a direct incentive to clear that wreck as safely and as quickly as possible, whereas as the government's not quite under that immediate pressure to clear that wreck and keep the, the roads going. So could you tell us a little bit more about competition and, and private roads and, and how that would work? Yeah, well, this reminds me, uh, uh, my uh, son and daughter-in-law have twin boys age six. 
And my daughter-in-law sometimes goes in the express lanes with her two boys. Mm -hmm. Because in order to get in the express lane, you have to have three people. That's right. That's right. So my daughter-in-law and, and the two boys are is whizzing through on the express lanes. And uh, everybody else is stuck bumper to bumper on the other two lanes. And you'd have a doctor or a lawyer or a CEO whose time is worth 500 an hour. And they're sitting there. And my daughter-in-law, now nothing against my daughter-in-law, I love my daughter-in-law, I love my grandchildren, they're just whizzing by because they go by number of people. Well, you don't do that in any other area, a number of people, you do it by uh, pay. Uh, who is willing, who rides a Maserati? People who have a, a big family? No, people who can pay for a Maserati. Who, uh, who has luxury steak or lobster? People with big families? No, not necessarily, uh, people who can afford it. So the whole thing is sort of out of whack with ordinary uh, industry. In ordinary industry, they don't go by the number of people and give them a, a break. You go by who can pay more for the luxury. And, and it's a luxurious thing to be able to ride in, in the, um, uh, what do they call it? The, the fast lane or the express the lane. The HOV lane, yeah. HOV, HOV yeah. lane, a high occupancy vehicle lane. Who gives a rat's rear end about high occupancy? What we should care about is if we want to maximize the GDP, who can pay for that stuff? Because the, the doctor and the, the lawyer and, and, and the uh, CEO whose time is worth 500 an hour, they'd be happy to uh, be in that HOV lane, but they're not allowed to because they're by themselves. So, you know, maybe what they'll do is they'll hire someone uh, to sit in the car with them so they can get the HOV. But well, you know, it's, it's funny you, you mentioned the paying people to, to ride in the car. I know that's a joke from uh, from one of the TV shows on HBO, but uh, I've, I've been to Oakland and I've seen where uh, Lyft drivers and Uber drivers pay somebody to ride from Oakland into San Francisco with them so they can get in early into San Francisco and start making money driving around because they got the HOV lane. Um, and it just brings up a concept, and I'm going to use the wrong words here, so please correct me if you know the right ones. But um, So we're going back to the cookie and shoes example versus the roads. Uh, unlike in the cookie example, where when I, when I ate more cookies, I didn't really affect you as another cookie consumer. In the road example, when I choose to come out and use the road uh, during rush hour, uh, I'm implicitly causing uh, a wait penalty on you, where you, you're going to have to wait longer because I'm using the same shared resource, even though I may not need it as badly right then. So that's kind of an economic um, uniqueness to, to the, the road system. I don't know. What's, what's that called? It's called external diseconomies or negative externalities. Negative uh, externalities, okay. Uh, uh, it's a so-called market failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, by market failures, other examples would be monopoly, externalities. So, so what, do they, what do they mean by market failures? Because my audience is, is not, uh, are not trained economists. So what, in English, what is a market failure? What a market failure is, is a failure of capitalism, a failure of the free enterprise system, supposedly. Uh, uh, that would be a negative externality when you uh, get out on the road and you slow me down. Uh, a so-called positive externality would be education. You're only going to get as much education as benefits you. Uh, you'll get a better job. You'll meet a better spouse. You'll have a better life. You'll get education. But there are spillover effects. Namely, if you are more educated, you're less likely to be a criminal, which will help me. You're more likely to vote better. To, so we'll have better politicians. So you're benefiting me. So that's called a, um, uh, an ex, uh, a positive externality or a, um, an external economy. And it's supposed to be a market failure because uh, under the free enterprise system, you're only going to have as much education, you selfish creature, you, to benefit you. You're not going to take into account the fact that you could benefit me. So the government should encourage you to have more education to take, uh, take into account these spillover effects. That would be a positive externality. Now, I don't think that that's correct. I think it's all nonsense. The negative externality would be um, you get on the road and you slow me down. But notice, it's only when you get on a public road that you slow me down. If you get on a private road, you're not slowing me down because the private road is going to have maximum uh, um, uh, prices. And the, the traffic is going to go at the, the appropriate level, uh, say 30 in the city and 70 in, uh, in the highway. Uh, so uh, I reject all market failures. I don't think monopoly is a market failure. I don't think externalities of public goods, none of it. Um, uh, well, you make an interesting point. How could it be a market failure if it's if it's a government? It's not a, a market failure. So I think you put your finger right on, on, on the nub, namely, how can it be a market failure if it occurs in the government sector, namely on, on a public road? So let's let's talk a little bit about implementation. So we, we talked, you know, about... Uh, 
public road problems and private road benefits. And we're going to come back to some criticisms kind of at the end. We don't have time to go through the full book. So you guys can definitely check out the book. I'll have a link to it uh, in the video below. But so let's, let's talk about implementation. And let's start with, with the existing roads. We've got these existing roads. The, the government owns them and, and we want to privatize them. Basically, we, we hit a fork in the road. We can either um, sell these roads in some fashion, whatever that looks like, like the FCC auctions off bandwidth or whatever. Um, or we can or we can give them away and, and in either case we've got different questions which which should we do should we sell the roads or should we give them away uh, neither um, I think what we should do is get back to John Locke a uh, famous philosopher and Murray Rothbard Hans Hoppe uh, uh, Stefan Kinsella other libertarians have made uh, important contributions to this what we should do is give it to the proper owners well who are the proper owners well, one uh, group of proper owners are the people who pay taxes to build the roads in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be ideal. But if you can't figure it out, then, uh, then we go to John Locke, who said you get to own uh, parts of nature or unowned resources. And I regard roads as unowned resources uh, with the people who've been mixing their labor with it. So let's take, um, I don't know, uh, I live uh, on St. Charles Avenue in New Orleans. Well, how many people have houses on the front of uh, St. Charles Avenue? I don't know, 5,000. Each one of them gets a share in the St. Charles um, uh, Avenue Corporation. And then people who've been using trucks get another share. So now we have a stock corporation of, um, I don't know, uh, 5,000, 10,000 people, and they own the St. Charles Avenue. And they make the rules for St. Charles Avenue. And we do the same thing. For, uh, Highway 10 uh, runs right through New Orleans, I think runs through Alabama mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Certainly uh, goes from Florida to uh, California. Well, how many people uh, either contributed tax money to it or uh, live nearby it and, and use it regularly? Those truckers would get to own a bit of it. So now you have a, a, a Highway 10 corporation with a, a million uh, stockholders, and that's how, how it is. So we don't um, uh, sell it. Because in my libertarian view, the government has already got way too much money. They don't need more money. They waste it anyway. Uh, so if we uh, had a bidding war for it, they would get the money for it. And I don't think they should get the, bid the money for it. I think that the um, Highway 10 Corporation should now own, uh, now own uh, the Highway 10, stretching from Florida uh, through um, uh, Alabama, through Louisiana, and on out uh, Texas and, and California. So the benefit is that when you do a good job, you make profits, you can expand your base of operation. When you do a bad job, you lose profits, you make losses. And if you don't change the error of your ways, you go broke and other people take over and, and presumably better people. That's why we have pretty good shirts and shoes and, and lollipops and, and pens and pencils because of this competitive system. So, so basically, we're gonna we're gonna get, we're gonna give it away, but we're gonna give it away to people who have some interest in using the road, and and we're gonna do that based on the idea that uh, this was paid in by the people as a whole. Some of those have passed on. Some of those can't even drive yet. However, however, and so you're just gonna get basically what you've got an interest in, um, and then we'll form these corporations, and then continuing down the implementation road, um, you know how to pay. Um, so I assume there'd be some kind of easy pass. You know they got the Peach Pass over in Georgia. Um, you put on your car, and when you go through the, the tolls, you, you, you pay through it. Um, you know, people say this is crazy, and you're going to have all these tolls, but I, I think the reality is more along the lines of something like Visa, MasterCard, and restaurants. You know, um, whether it's Visa or MasterCard or, or um, Discover Card or American Express or, you know, Diner's Card is the original one. But, you know, these are all accepted at different vendors. They're different uh, credit card providers with different credit requirements and, and different anti-fraud measures. Uh, but fundamentally, to me, as the consumer, they they behave the same, um, and they're and they're very competitive. And and I imagine that the road system, especially in modern times, would work in a very similar fashion. When I first write it, started writing about this in the 1970s, I was reading journals in um, what was it, groceries and pharmaceuticals, and people were saying, "Why are you reading stuff about groceries?" The reason I was reading it: here's a milk bottle, and here is a universal product code. And they were starting to put in uh, universal product codes in grocers. And now you uh, you go to the supermarket and you go blip and, and they register how much it is and whatever. Well, my idea was you stick that on the underbody of a car. The universal product code that we have on bottles of milk, like here, there's a bottle of milk. 
And uh, you stick that in a car and we have GPS. We have all sorts of ways of uh, sending you a monthly bill or, you know, you, you uh, subscribe to a TV uh, acorn or something like that. You pay a monthly bill or you don't even pay it. They take it out of your uh, bank account kind of thing. Yeah, that's the way it would work uh, so that nobody's going to be paying tolls. Whereas right now you, you go on the George Washington Bridge or any of these bridges and you line up for, you know, 10 miles of cars waiting to uh, pay. Now, happily, we have Easy Pass. Yeah. Thank God the government has Easy Pass only 30 years later. Well, I mean, I think people, it's, it's a convenience factor. And we saw that the original turnpikes, it kind of failed because of that. They couldn't get the flow going enough to keep people from going around. And so that kind of made those uh, original ones fail. Uh, but in modern times, we are still paying in some fashion a fee to use the road, um, a toll fee. Every time that we buy gasoline or I've got an electric car, I pay an annual fee, um, so, which assumes that you almost double the usage of an average gas driver, by the way. Um, and, and, and you pay that fee. It's just you're not paying it nickel and dime. You're paying it once at the pump and it's kind of built in. You don't you don't see it. So it's kind of um, emotionally less disturbing, I guess, is one way I, I would put it. But so going on to the new roads, you know, one of the, one of the criticisms that's brought up constantly um, is the concept of purchase versus eminent domain. Um, and there's a great quote from the book that, that, that says, you know, landowners are forced to give up their property at prices determined to be, quote, fair, unquote, by the federal bureaucracy, not at prices to which they voluntarily agree. Um, and, you know, if, if you've watched the other videos on this channel, we've, we went to great lengths to talk about the difference between utility and value and how value is personal. Uh, and how utility uh, could be quite objective um, and could be seen by a third party. And I would argue that any time eminent domain is enforced by the government, they're not paying the full actual fair market value of the price uh, for that good because the value of the owner is actually not possibly, can't even be taken into consideration um, by these, these external forces who are going to make up this fair price. So I think that's absolutely unfair. The government's basically getting a better deal on land than they should. Um, but people act as if without this option, we, we simply couldn't build private roads. Better yet, build, build them at a rate that would be profitable or in a, a direct route that's economically sensible. What do, what do you say to that? Well, I think I devote a whole chapter in the book because that's one of the most important objections. Do we need eminent domain? And only government to, can do eminent domain. Look, uh, right now I notice you're wearing a nice shirt. I'll give you 10 bucks for it. You say no. I say I'll give you 20. I'll give you 100. Your grandmother gave it to you on her deathbed, let's say, and, and you have great psychic value. And you're not willing to sell it for a million dollars. But fair market value is, I don't know, 30 bucks or whatever a shirt like that costs. Well, if I... If, compel you to sell me that shirt for 30 bucks and it's worth a million to you i just stole a million minus 30 bucks from you and it's the same thing you, the grandpa gave you this farm and you don't want to sell that farm uh, at all forever uh, uh, and and i want to build a road through it and i say well you know the acreage around here sells for uh, ten thousand an acre i'm going to take two acres so i'm going to give you twenty thousand and you say what i don't want to sell it for twenty thousand i don't want to sell it for anything now there is the holdout problem Mm -hmm. And that is, I want to build a road from Florida to uh, California. I want to build I-10. How many people own land between Florida and, and California? I don't know, 10 million or whatever the number is. And my favorite uh, holdout is, is um, a Cartman from South Park. Yes. Are you in South Park? Yeah, I love uh, South Park. Cartman is my favorite character. You know, uh, uh, his motto is, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys. I'm going home. <laughs> I'm sorry? Hey, he says, yeah, screw you guys. I'm taking my ball and going home. Right. That's yeah. right. And, and Cartman owns, uh, say, some land in, in Texas. And Cartman says, you know, screw you. I don't care what, you know, uh, I'm not selling. Now, here you're Cartman, and you have to defend 10 square miles. And all I have to do is get 150 feet through. Uh, I'm talking six lane with a, a green sward in between, you know, each lane is 10 feet wide. So that's 30 feet and, and 40 feet and 30 feet. All I have to do is get 100 feet through you. You have to defend 10,000, uh, uh, rather 1,000, uh, uh, what did I say, 10 miles. I'm going to win. Yeah, so I think, I think the point there is, is that uh, there are alternate routes for any, for any road, right, within certain reason, right? I mean, um, on, on the roads, and I think one of those is one of those market solutions is the concept of options contracts, right? Where you go, you go to the private property owner and you say, okay, Mr. Private Property Owner, 
I don't want to buy your land just yet, but if I were to buy your land, how much will you sell it to me for? And they name, you know, $200,000, whatever it might be. And you say, okay, well then I will pay you a fee to hold that option open for me because I may or may not need your land. How much do you want for that option? And then you pay that option fee. And then now Cartman is all of a sudden surrounded by people who have options on their property that are slightly worse routes but it prevents him from holding out because I can go that route and I can chain these options together to actually achieve my, my road. And the example I would give similar to this is what happened with Walt Disney World um, down in Florida. You know, they went through several LLCs and several uh, different listings agents and slowly bought up enough land to buy Walt Disney World without paying a high premium. And in their case, they needed a huge continuous block of land, unlike the road that just needs kind of that path going through that you were talking about. No, no, you're quite right. I, I do have that in the book. Uh, but then I assume that Cartman owns a, a, a vertical land, which is uh, 100 miles uh, from north to south. <laughs> and, and there's no way to go around them. You have to go to Mexico or up to through Canada or something crazy like that. Only then do you get into the tunnels and, and the bridges if the options fail. But you're quite right. In any reasonable thing, there's not going to be any Cartman that owns any uh, amount of land. What you're going to do is, is you might say, look, there are, you don't have to go the way the crow flies. You don't have to go exactly uh, 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 what do you call it, a, a perpendicular line or mm -hmm. horizontal line. Uh, you can go a little wavy. Or, there are mountains. You, you, you might I don't think anybody disputes that. If you, look at any, if you look at any map of the interstate system today, they're not in straight lines. As a matter of fact, there's a great example um, from Montana with, uh, with the uh, I-90 where a senator brought the road up into Montana before it continued west, not because there was a need for traffic or because people in Montana necessarily wanted the interstate. He was just a powerful senator, and that's where the road landed, and that's that happens time and time again. Oh, you had the same thing in Alaska, the road to nowhere. Some mm -hmm. senator got a lot of money, and he put a road, and nobody goes there. I mean, that's just government. But, uh, but the point is, uh, in any realistic scenario, you say, look, there are five ways we can go, A, B, C, D, E. And uh, you can tell people, we want to have a road, and you guys get together, and as soon as you get me the options, we'll go that route. And if the options fail, uh, we don't have we don't have this ad colon doctrine. Uh, the ad colon doctrine says that if you own flat land, you own up into the heavens and down into the center of the earth. Nonsense. According to John Locke, you only own what you mix your labor with, mm -hmm. and you mix your labor with uh, 20,000 feet above or uh, 5,000 feet below. So if I put a tunnel there first, I, I can uh, short circuit your uh, holdout, uh, uh, Mr. Cartman. Um, so as far as access goes, uh, Rothbard, and you quote this in your book, uh, in his book, For New Liberty, he says, the answer is that everyone in purchasing homes or street service in a libertarian society would make sure that the purchase or lease contract provides full access for whatever term of years is specified with this sort of easement provided in advance by contract, no such sudden blockade would be allowed. So in other words, just like we have easements for power and water and, and, and uh, trash and that kind of thing, we, you would get similar access built in. Um, it's a necessity for life. It's just unconceivable that, that it would go down any other way. I agree that um, no road owner would give you an easement because he wants you to build a house on his road. And if he was obdurate and said he was going to charge you a million dollars to get in or out, you wouldn't put your house there. So the market would take care of that. I mean, uh, right now, when you buy a house, you have, um, a, what do you call it, title insurance to make sure That's somebody right. else doesn't own it. Well, then you'd have access insurance to make sure you can get in and out. So that that is an objection that I think uh, we overcome in, the, in this book. Yeah, um, I think you do, actually. Well, great stuff. This is a, a super deep topic. Check out uh, Dr. Block's book on it. We'll have a link below. Dr. Block, thank you very much for taking the time today to talk to us about free markets and roads. And I hope you have a, a, a great rest of your evening. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure.